This video is sponsored by NordVPN. When we think back to the great imperial trade powers of Europe, Britain is likely the first of those to come to mind, and understandably so. Following their surpassing of the rival empires of Spain and France, the British dominated the seas with their unrivaled navy and strategically located colonial holdings for over a century, but of course the British weren't always top dog globally or even in Europe alone. As we've gone over in prior videos, there was a time before Britain's rise when France seemed the prime contender to one day determine how the world would spin. This was an early phase in what would become the second peak of the Anglo-French rivalry, so intense that many have termed this new era of animosity the Second Hundred Years' War. Despite this, Britain, or rather just England at the time, had actually been falling behind its mainland counterparts in the decades leading up to this point, and it appeared that a relatively new country would soon succeed them as a leading economic power and as France's foremost rival. That country was the United Provinces of the Netherlands, or simply the Dutch Republic. The dominantly Protestant Republic had broken away from Catholic Habsburg rule in the late 1500s, about one century prior to the revived Anglo-French rivalry. Very quickly, the independent republic soared to massive economic heights unmatched by even its much larger neighbors. It held claim to the continent's most impressive merchant and naval fleets, acquired valuable colonies which enabled it to conduct global trade, and emerged as a center for European banking and commerce, all of which greatly enriched the small country, raising it to continental and global prominence. Being a rich, geographically small, and mostly Protestant republic surrounded by large, ambitious Catholic kingdoms, the Dutch were regularly targeted by the likes of England, Spain, and France. While the French proved to be a capable threat for much of the republic's existence, the English had been long undergoing a turbulent cultural and political transition as power shifted from the absolutist Catholic traditions of old to a new reformed model, leading to much crippling bloodshed and instability which the Dutch sought to exploit in hopes of gaining an edge over France or at the very least alleviating the burden of needing deal with so many enemies at once. This would ultimately result in what amounted to a Dutch conquest of England in 1688 during what was known as the Glorious Revolution. But before going any further, let's take a moment to thank today's generous sponsor, NordVPN. Folks, if you've been with the channel for a while, you might know that some of our content is unviewable in parts of Europe and Asia. The internet gives you access to a vast hub of informative resources that make it a treasure trove of knowledge for those who wish to seek it out. But across the globe, geographic censorship is a major issue which might keep you from seeing the whole picture. That's why services like NordVPN are increasingly valuable today. NordVPN is a virtual private network which, among other things, can redirect your internet connection to servers in over 60 different countries, allowing you to bypass censorship. Beyond that, NordVPN works to protect your privacy online whether you're at home or using public Wi-Fi. You can rest assured that NordVPN is providing you extra layers of security against hackers, aggressive advertisers, and possibly even a spying government, all seeking to collect your data for any number of nefarious purposes. Right now, NordVPN is offering a great discount to everybody watching this video. All you have to do is click the link in our description to go to nordvpn.com slash monsterz and sign up. Remember that you can try it out for 30 days, and if for any reason you're not completely satisfied, you can count on a full money-back guarantee. Once again, that's nordvpn.com slash monsterz for the crucial protection you ought have online. Links in the description. Now, back to the video. To understand the glorious revolution of 1688, we first have to go back a couple of years to 1660, when the House of Stuart was reinstalled on the British throne after a period of being under the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell. The new king, Charles II, was however not very popular because of his strong pro-Catholic and pro-French sympathies. When he died in 1685, after having converted to Catholicism on his deathbed, his brother James II inherited the throne, but because his brother was already a Catholic, this only worsened the royal family's unpopularity within the largely Protestant United Kingdom. James embodied nearly all the traits of the old order which the majority reform population had come to resent. He disregarded parliamentary authority, promoted Catholicism under the guise of tolerance, elevated Catholics to positions of power, built up a large army during peacetime, expressed increasingly pro-French views, and dismissed what many had come to recognize as fundamental rights. However, he was also middle-aged and without male heirs, while both his daughters Mary and Anne were devoutly Protestant. Thus, many accepted James as just a small road bump on the path to continued reformation and progress. That is, until, in his middle age, he had a son. One many accused of being illegitimate upon the realization that James intended on raising this would-be king as a Catholic. Meanwhile, on the other side of the North Sea, the Protestant Dutch stadtholder William III, also known as William of Orange, saw the Catholic king's unpopularity as a great opportunity. 
He was also married to King James's daughter Mary, which meant he had a legal claim to the British throne. William certainly took interest in what was occurring right across the sea, but at this point he was still unsure if it was the right time to strike. Certainly the French king who openly referred to William as his mortal enemy would not simply allow him to invade and conquer what under recent kings had been a budding ally across the channel. Not even considering that, who's to say the English wouldn't automatically reject this foreigner as their ruler? To gauge precisely how receptive England would be to his intervention, he maintained good communications with a number of elites who secretly conveyed to him the fear that James would soon be violently overthrown. Plunging England into a second civil war in which William would be forced to support a Protestant faction against a Catholic faction led by France. As they saw it, one way or another, foreign boots would be setting foot on English soil, and the advantage they held now could not be guaranteed in the future. This made the matter all the more urgent and William decided to move forward with the invasion, but only if he was officially invited to intervene by English officials so as to not appear to the public as a conqueror but simply a bringer of order replacing Catholic James with rightful successor Protestant Mary, and himself as Mary's co-ruler. Upon receiving his invitation, William gathered a massive fleet with which to invade England, landing with a presence so intimidating that James opted to flee to France rather than defend his claim, leaving the seat vacant and thus open for the reign of the Dutch royals. And thus William III became King of England, Scotland and Ireland in 1689, besides his status as stadtholder in the Dutch Republic, putting the Dutch Republic and the British Isles under a personal union. In our timeline, this union ended because of the fact William and Mary failed to produce an heir to the throne before William's death in 1702. William and Mary's childlessness was not from a lack of trying either. Mary had become pregnant at one point but lost the child before it was born and was unable to become pregnant again, strongly suggesting this miscarriage led her to become infertile. This conclusion led the royals to seek out and prepare the sole remaining Protestant male successor in their immediate family, the infirm son of Mary's younger sister, Anne, Prince William, Duke of Gloucester. As you might expect, he passed away before he could succeed William, thus only Anne remained within the Protestant Stuart line, forcing her to pass the throne onto her distant relatives in the House of Hanover, a German royal family which would bring England the likes of King George III and Queen Victoria. It would be succeeded by a subsequent German royal house which would eventually change its name to the House of Windsor, the current royal house of Britain. But what if all that changed? What if William sired an heir and the House of Orange remained the ruling house of England? First of all, I don't think there would have been much lasting direct everyday cultural impact as was the case with most personal unions of this kind. I just don't see the two nations influencing each other too much directly outside of the army, governments or in colonial affairs. I also don't think the Union would have lasted later than up to the Napoleonic Wars. The United Kingdom of the Netherlands would most likely still have been formed, because the North Sea is way too much of a barrier for the UK and the Netherlands to remain one country into the 19th and 20th centuries. There's also a decent chance the Spanish Netherlands would have gone to the Anglo-Dutch Union after the Spanish War of Succession, rather than to Austria. This would have made the gap between the Northern and Southern Netherlands much smaller than in our timeline, meaning there probably wouldn't have been the Belgian Revolution in 1830. History with Hilbert makes many excellent points. The geographic disconnect, diverging interests, and cultural differences between the two states may initially keep them from undergoing a union the likes of that with Scotland. However, as the personal union with Hanover in our timeline has shown us, there is a strong likelihood for this alternate House of Orange to maintain its dual rulership for at least a few generations. As you might have guessed, it was in fact William's rise to power in England which initially reignited the Anglo-French rivalry we were discussing earlier in the video. That animosity between the French and Dutch rubbed off on England upon William's ascendancy and set in motion a long battle for global supremacy, though at great cost to the Netherlands who expected to have England in their corner for the foreseeable future. Despite superior Dutch naval abilities of the time, there was no escaping the fact that they stood easily within striking distance of France and as such aimed to curtail France's expansion on the continent first and foremost. Colonial expansion was certainly important for the Dutch given their role as a trade giant, However, unlike England who stood comfortably removed from continental affairs, the Netherlands were inescapably tied to them. Colonies and ships were good for business, but buffer states and armies were necessary for survival. Thus, naval and overseas development would always be secondary to continental security for a Dutch-led union, consequently tying England ever closer to Europe in the process. This means English men and money were and would continue to be spent in what would ultimately be Dutch conflicts whenever the Republic saw an opportunity to strengthen its position over France. We saw something similar happen during England's personal union with Hanover, needing regularly defend it whenever tensions in Germanic Europe heated up, 
and it often served as a great vulnerability for them. The French, knowing that they could force England to stand down if they managed to capture the Hanoverian king's ancestral land. Unlike the Netherlands, however, Hanover was slightly more removed from major European affairs, being more concerned with local German politics, and it was nowhere near the major player the Dutch Republic had been by that point. So while a union with Hanover may have allowed England to place a greater emphasis on overseas expansion on account of fewer continental demands, the House of Orange would be far more invested in mainland Europe. Certainly, the Anglo-Dutch Empire still establishes a vast overseas presence through colonization, though these colonies would not be as thoroughly populated and developed as those of our timeline, save for those already well settled by England such as the 13 colonies. All other newly established Anglo-Dutch colonies would be, above all else, stations at which to dock ships, extract resources, and little more. Over the next century, this Anglo-Dutch Empire would find itself engaged in three major European wars. The War of Spanish Succession, the War of Austrian Succession, and the Seven Years' War. William of Orange had seen the beginnings of the first major conflict but passed away before its conclusion, leaving the Dutch Republic to come away with little to show for its efforts. In part, this is because England under Queen Anne had actually betrayed its allies in the first days of the conflict to strike a secret deal with France, earning it several valuable concessions at the cost of fracturing Anglo-Dutch relations after the Republic had invested so many of its own resources into England during William's rule. In this alternate timeline, that's not the case. Remaining a unified front under the cohesive guidance of a single ruler with Dutch sympathies, we could expect the Union to acquire the Spanish Netherlands, which would have otherwise gone to Austria, possibly retaining the Principality of Orange as well, which is actually situated not in the Netherlands, but in southern France. Given how inconvenient and disconnected this realm is from other Anglo-Dutch holdings, William's successor might still surrender it while retaining the House of Orange title. Now, in our timeline, the Dutch had experienced a great decline post-war, having lost their capable ruling dynasty, their most promising ally, and a tremendous sum of money precisely as the Dutch economy was losing momentum. The results were disastrous, and the economic foundations laid in England during William's time essentially siphoned away the Republic's assets in regard to business, banking, and trade. The Dutch could no longer afford to maintain the colonies they had been counting on to ease them back into financial stability, nor could it afford to remain in competition with France. However, now in union with England, at least some of those burdens could be alleviated, and it may just allow for the establishment of a more political union despite prior mentioned differences. The Scots had been experiencing particularly poor fortune in the previous decades, from a deadly famine which nearly wiped out a fifth of the population, to failed colonial ventures which essentially left the kingdom bankrupt, and diminishing trade opportunities with continental powers, leaving Scotland largely dependent upon England for trade. This led to the Acts of Union which transformed the kingdoms of England and Scotland into the Kingdom of Great Britain. With the Netherlands in no better shape than Scotland, and England still rising as the dominant kingdom within the Union, the Anglo-Dutch king may concede to having his homeland made an essential secondary player to England within an even closer union, doing so to ensure the Netherlands recover from its economic slump. Now that being said, even despite support from the king and likely Dutch support in order to reassume their prior glory, there is very little incentive for Scotland and England to integrate themselves with the Netherlands, who would only draw them deeper into continental politics. The Republic's request to unite with Great Britain would be rebuffed, and tensions between the King and Parliament would begin to rise as the personal union began to splinter. It's at this point that we'd see the timeline drift very close to our own, as England resumes its guiding role in the British Isles and largely turns attention back to naval matters instead of those on the continent. The king would do whatever in his power to support the Netherlands, but would continually bend to the whim of Britain, as beyond merely supporting his home realm, there also stood the greater task of maintaining a powerful front against France. In the end, whether or not the Netherlands saw its demands met, a week in France was still good news for the Dutch, and so cooperation would continue. The War of Austrian Succession, as in our timeline, would see little territory change hands, but would begin to signal the shifting tides of European politics. The Anglo-Dutch Empire is able to mount a more effective defense of the Netherlands thanks to earlier investment in stronger land defenses, but is slightly less effective in blockading France at sea, allowing them to emerge from the conflict financially stronger than they had been in our world, though despite this, little else would really change even following the Seven Years' War. France's king during the time was among the kingdom's most incompetent, and it's likely he'd still make several of the same mistakes he had in our timeline, regardless of whether or not the country was in slightly better shape. Britain, though it had briefly detracted from its naval development, would be back on course within only a decade or two, leaving it still very likely to emerge victorious in the greater war against France, 
giving way to the American Revolution, the French Revolution, and the Napoleonic Wars, and the Britain of this world would become near indistinguishable from that of our world, save for a different ruling dynasty. That would seem to be the most likely conclusion, but just for the sake of this video, let's wind back and suppose the pro-Dutch king has far more authority, allowing him to integrate the Dutch Republic into the Kingdom of Great Britain, despite objections from the English and Scottish populations. This would ultimately be a timeline in which rather than England naturally emerging as the greater of the two powers, the Netherlands uses English resources to rebuild itself without regard for the offshore kingdoms. England and Scotland would retain their own independent parliaments to manage local governance, however both would be subject to higher Dutch authority. The pro-Dutch king justifies his neglecting of Britain to reinforce the Netherlands by reasoning that the islands are protected by a natural barrier, whereas the Republic is not. The British coast would make for an excellent docking and shipbuilding site, secluded far enough away from French attacks while the Dutch economy recovered, proceeding to reinvest itself in trade colonialism, primarily targeting the West Indies, South America, and Southeast African coast. Come the War of Austrian Succession, the Netherlands would perform exceptionally well on land, however in Britain, France would have facilitated a far more successful Jacobite uprising, the Jacobites being followers of the Catholic Stuart line which sought to restore their king to the throne. In our world, this same rising ultimately failed due to a lack of English support, however this time around with the pro-Dutch king having repeatedly undermined English interests, there's now much more incentive to back the Jacobites simply as an anti-Dutch faction, ousting the House of Orange and reinstalling the Catholic House of Stuart. Having effectively pillaged the wealth and resources of Britain and no longer seeing it as worth fighting for, the Dutch would abandon the islands, leaving them in Jacobite hands. Internal instability within Britain could be expected to follow, leaving the Netherlands not too worried about any threat they might pose in the near future, focusing instead on bolstering its domestic defenses and economic empire in preparation for its ultimate showdown against France less than one decade later. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching, and once again thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring today's scenario. Support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.